I don't know who to thank first. So thank you all for being here, and thanks for being who you are. Dr. Pellegrini, new initiates, fellows of the college, honored guests, officers, it is with both pride and awe that I welcome you to this 100th convocation of the American College of Surgeons, which, as you have heard, is truly an international society of nearly 80,000 members. My journey to this podium has been propelled by talented colleagues and trainees, valued collaborators, and invaluable mentors. President Pellegrini, I still will call you that, you have been a leader worthy of being followed. I hope I have learned from you and our predecessors as ACS presidents, and that I will represent the college wisely as you have. I owe much to my family, who tolerated and supported my absences in the interest of my patients, and especially to Brenda, my wife of three decades, on whose constant support I have depended. Brenda, thank you. But this is your night, new initiates to fellowship. I know that your family, teachers, and mentors are justly proud of you, just as I take personal pride in those among you in whose progress I have had a hand. Now is your time to put your hard work and preparation to use, to become your personal best. The door is opening to your future. In this first year of the second century of the American College of Surgeons, let's revisit our beginnings. I want to share a story about an extraordinary man, profoundly influential but flawed, visionary but in his own words, quixotic, a surgeon whose story is woven into the fabric of our college through a century of improving the care of the surgical patient. Ernest Amory Codman, who preferred to be called Emory, had a privileged upbringing in Boston. He was what some term a preparation H. He was a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Medical School, trained at a Harvard hospital, the Massachusetts General, or MGH, and had an appointment at Harvard Medical School and MGH, at least for a while, but I get ahead of myself. As a medical student in 1895, he and his classmate, Harvey Cushing, later a renowned neurosurgeon, witnessed a fatal outcome from ether anesthesia, which had been introduced at MGH 50 years earlier. To provide data, remember that word, to assure the safety of their patients, they began to record pulse, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. These ether charts, very simple in concept, now residing in the Countway Library at Harvard Medical School, were in fact the first anesthesia records and have been responsible for saving many thousands of lives. The following year, he began to experiment with the newly discovered x-rays to study anatomy. And this experience led to his appointment in 1899, only four years after graduating from medical school, as, quote, skiographer. I didn't know what that meant either. It's radiologist at Boston Children's Hospital. And those studies were the foundation of his extensive work on bone and joint diseases, culminating in his classic book, The Shoulder, in 1934. Codman's big contribution, however, was what he called the end result idea. This was the common sense notion that every hospital and every surgeon should follow every patient long enough to determine whether or not the treatment was successful and to inquire, if not, why not, with a view to preventing similar failures in the future to improving the efficiency of care, his term for effectiveness and quality, the terms we use today. 
In 1911, he opened the tiny 12-bed Codman Hospital in Boston, near the Massachusetts General, to test his ideas. He kept records on every patient on three by five cards for a year. He rated the outcomes with absolute honesty, error in diagnosis, error in judgment, error in treatment, and so on. In fact, the basis for the modern morbidity and mortality conference. In 1917, he published a book entitled A Study of Hospital Efficiency, which contained the records of all 337 cases treated over five years at the Codman Hospital, good and bad results alike, and offered it free to any member of the American College of Surgeons. It's a marvel of public reporting that, in fact, would be very difficult to replicate in today's litigious environment. It's noteworthy, and I call to your attention, that these end results were for an individual surgeon, but are intended as building blocks for improving the field. Presciently, he stated that insurance companies, large industrial plants, and even the state may find that it will be less expensive in the long run to send patients to us, that quality costs less. And in 1917, he wrote that evaluation and follow-up, the end result idea, were a necessary precondition to adoption of a national health insurance system 93 years before the Affordable Care Act. In 1911, Dr. Codman and Edward Martin, then the president of the Clinical Congress of Surgeons of North America, that's different, discussed the formation of an American College of Surgeons. Edward Martin asked Franklin Martin, no relation, to lead the organization of the ACS, and he asked Codman to form and chair its Committee on Standardization of Hospitals. That committee later evolved into the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, now known simply as the Joint Commission. Expressing Codman's priorities, Edward Martin wrote that the tail, the end result idea, is more important than the dog, the ACS, but we shall have to have the dog to wag the, to wag the tail. Codman felt strongly that the outcomes, the end results of a surgeon's practice should determine his promotion rather than just seniority, as was in fact the practice at MGH at the time. It's not surprising that the senior surgical leadership did not take kindly to Codman's suggestions, that their outcomes be held up to scrutiny and criticism. Recounting that time, Codman wrote, in order to attract the attention of the trustees of the MGH, I resigned from the staff in 1914 as a protest against the seniority system of promotion, which was obviously incompatible with the end result idea. On the day on which I received acceptance of my resignation, I wrote again, asking to be appointed surgeon in chief on the grounds that the results of treatment of my patients during the last 10 years had been demonstrably better than theirs. Naturally, my letter was ignored, and I was not appointed Surgeon in Chief. On January 6, 1915, Ernest Amory Codman used his position as chairman of the surgical section of the local medical society to push this end result idea. At the conclusion of a slate of speakers on hospital efficiency, accurate measurement of outcomes, and standardization, Codman unveiled a six-foot cartoon drawn on brown paper. It depicted the medical community and the leaders of Harvard and the Massachusetts General Hospital as caring only about the golden eggs being kicked to them by an ostrich with its head in the sand, and not about the facts that support optimal patient care. Not surprisingly, Codman managed to offend just about everyone in the surgical and education community, and he was forced to resign the chairmanship of the Surgical Society. He was dropped from Harvard, the Harvard Medical School faculty, and later that year, his reputation marred. He resigned the chairmanship of the Hospital Standardization Committee of the American College of Surgeons. Despite these setbacks, he persisted and continued to, to speak out in support of the end result idea. On December 6, 
1917, there was a mammoth explosion of an ammunition ship in Halifax Harbor in, Ca in Canada. The explosion leveled uh, much of Halifax, killed 3,000 people out of a total population of 60,000, and left more than 20,000 injured. Codman immediately responded by closing his hospital and left Boston the very next day with nurses and another surgeon to help those in need in Halifax. Of course, he kept his end result cards in every patient over the succeeding months. Each year since, the city of Halifax remembers Codman's humanitarian help by sending a mammoth Christmas tree to decorate a public plaza in Boston. It strikes me that his action presaged another ACS program, Operation Giving Back, through which surgeons selflessly volunteer their skills in time of disaster, as well as to address other unmet needs for surgical care to the underserved at home and abroad. Today, increasing numbers of medical students, surgical residents, surgeons, and surgical institutions like the American College of Surgeons are recognizing and responding to the call for help, not only for direct provision of treatment, but also for sustaining benefits through helping to develop the skills of indigenous caregivers. Shortly after that time in Halifax, Codman went off to serve in the Army during World War I. On returning to Boston in 1919, he was deeply in debt, had no hospital appointment, and was unable to reopen the Codman Hospital. In subsequent years, he struggled to make a living and to support his family. In 1920, he became interested in the treatment of bone sarcomas, about which little was then known. He circulated a letter to ACS fellows requesting information about their cases for a clinical research database. Again ahead of his time, he explained, quote, by grouping cases into series large enough to favor comparative study, and by observing definite previously determined points, a rational and clinical science can be developed. Unquote. Initially disappointed with a lack of responses, he joined with James Ewing, a New York pathologist, and Joseph Bloodgood, a surgeon at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, to develop a registry of bone sarcoma, which was adopted as a standing committee of the ACS in 1921. This registry was the first, in this, uh, first cancer registry in this country, and it was a, pr a precursor of other later da ACS databases, such as the National Trauma Data Bank and the National Cancer Database. Characteristically, he scolded the ACS fellows for their apathy in a journal article in which he said, the American College of Surgeons expects something more of its fellows than annual dues. It expects any fellow who has undertaken the care of a case of bone sarcoma to give the other members of the college and through them to the rest of the profession the benefits of the experience gained. New fellows, take heed of that injunction. We owe it to each other and to our patients to improve our profession actively and continuously, to add to new knowledge, and to innovate when we can. Be involved in shaping the changes in healthcare delivery, in advocacy, and in giving back to society for the opportunities we've been given. In subsequent years, Emory Codman was slowly accepted back into the fold. The soil, organized medicine, was finally prepared to nurture the seed he planted. He was reinstated at the MGH in 1929, and when he died in 1940 from melanoma, the MGH trustees paid him this tribute, quote, champion of truth, original in thought, firm in his convictions, and willing to sacrifice personal place and standing to achieve what he believed to be right. Mankind, medicine, and the Massachusetts General Hospital are his debtors." Unquote. Dr. Codman's ashes were interred in his wife's family plot in the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a National Historic Site. Earlier, he had married Catherine Bowditch, 
a member of a prominent Boston and MGH family who was active in the women's suffrage movement and nursing education. Because of the difficult financial circumstances at the time of his death, he instructed Katie Bowditch not to spend money on a headstone. And for 74 years, his ashes have lain in an unmarked grave. I am very pleased to report to you that our college, along with the Joint Commission and the Orthopedic Shoulder Societies, the Massachusetts General Physicians Organization, and others, has led a successful campaign to design and create a fitting headstone for Dr. Codman. It was installed on July 22, 2014, with appropriate recognition of the significant achievements on behalf of surgical standards. So what can we learn from Codman's career and his contributions, his end results? With a century's hindsight, we see the strength of his pioneering ideas on quality based on a record of scientific truth, as he put it, on evidence, not on eminence. He asked if it is possible to standardize the treatment of disease or the work of individual members of hospital staffs. He answered, quote, such standards can be established. Notably, the object of standards is to raise them. I would add, good enough is not good enough. He can be considered the father of outcomes research, process improvement in surgery, and in fact, quality as the driving force of ACS programs today. But Codman's flaw was his tendency to excess, his intentionally disruptive personality. It is not sufficient to have a good idea. You must bring leadership to get others to buy into new concepts and programs. He failed to recognize that leading change requires developing consensus rather than demanding it. That change management should utilize the very data he collected, not blunt force. The cartoon that he presented at the Regional Medical Society meeting was exactly the wrong way to achieve the change he desired. His lifelong friend, Edward Martin, wrote to him that, quote, the wheels of progress must hurt and bruise someone, but the chariot should be drawn with some thought as to reducing to its minimum the crop of the crippled, unquote. Codman did come to peace with his failings in the end. He said, again I quote, if the prophet is confident of the value of his service, he may keep his equanimity in spite of the jeers of his contemporaries. Although the end result idea may not achieve its entire fulfillment for several generations, it's now 100 years, I hope to be as content when dying as any soldier on the battlefield. And he said, the man who may be called unselfish works for the next generation and necessarily cannot be paid for it except in honor. Yogi Berra, the baseball star and humorist philosopher, said that prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> well, Codman did predict the future. He fought for it, and he paid for it. But Codman's vision has not yet been fully reached. We have registries, like the ACS National Quality Improvement Program, Surgical and Quality Program. We have guidelines for efficient and appropriate care. We have statistics for outcomes of hospitals and practices and disciplines. However, measurement science is still somewhat short of an established methodology to assess the outcomes of most individual surgeons, as Codman did for himself. To that end, the American College of Surgeons has initiated the surgeon-specific registry for each surgeon to record the outcomes of each of his or her cases, which is a step in the right direction. I urge each of you to utilize the SSR in order to gain insights into your own practice. In addition, evaluations by patients, such as the consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems, assess those outcomes that are important to those patients and should be a key component in determining appropriate care. In the end, 
It is up to each of us to measure, track, and improve our own end results to achieve our personal best. And this should be our message to legislators, to insurers, to the public, and especially to ourselves. In Codman's words, again, if not, why not? And if not us, who? Unbeknownst to us, when my class of initiates, the class of 1974, sat in your seats, there were five other future ACS presidents sitting among us. A little, an extraordinary coincidence. But there were also innovators, scientists, and great clinical surgeons. There are those among you who will be tomorrow's contributors and leaders. Every one of you, every one of you, will bring life-saving and health-restoring care to patients around the world. You will bring new ideas, new techniques, new skills, and new compassion to those who need your help. The Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. Something better replaced it. And the field of surgery is changing. In this largest group of initiates ever, more of you are women, 22%, and more are international medical graduates, 26% from 61 countries than in any previous class. Most of you are likely to be employed by a hospital, group practice, medical school, or system. Teams and multidisciplinary care are superseding the lone surgeon. Minimally invasive surgical techniques and technologies are changing how surgery is practiced. Simulation is changing how surgery is taught. Healthcare delivery systems are coalescing rapidly. New organs are being tissue engineered. DNA is being rebuilt to cure and prevent disease. The potential to heal is ever growing. Change is the only constant. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace and foster change. Be ready to take risks thoughtfully. You are accomplished surgeons today. You've studied, struggled, worked to wear the robes you have on, the robes of an ACS fellow. But if you don't continue to improve and evolve, tomorrow you will be the surgeon you are today. No better. And good enough is not good enough. So I ask, is there a Codman among you? I wish for you good luck and success. But I wish from you clear sight for your future excellence, hard work for your patients and for our profession, and forthright leadership on whatever path you choose. My generation will be passing the baton, symbolized by this great mace of the American College of Surgeons, to yours. Carry it forward proudly. Be your best. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated until the recession of officers, honorary fellows, regents, governors, and dignitaries, and the new fellows and of the new fellows uh, has concluded. I'd like to remind you that the reception honoring the new fellows of the college will be held outside. I think it will be on the second floor rather than the, than the third as originally planned. Please return your robes before attending this reception. I was going to ask you to stand, but it looks like you already are. But I'll ask anyway. Will the assembly please stand?